<laughs> right. Hi, welcome, Paul Elliott, and uh, thanks for joining me on this blog uh, about the Hotel Esplanade, the SV. If I could just ask um, to, yeah, tell me a little bit about yourself. Yeah, well, I guess I was I, actually what started it really, I was a frustrated, I wouldn't say musician, <laughs> I'd say more performer, you know. I, I really liked performers, you know, I really liked front people and, you know, my claim to fame there actually, I didn't mention that before, is I was on New Faces uh, <laughs> back in the, when I first arrived in Australia in, in early, in, in 1970. And I got myself on new faces. It's funny how it was a different era in those times. I actually came became, came second oh, wow. uh, with a song that I wrote called Heaven and Hell or the Bathroom Floor. Oh, that's hilarious. And, uh, <laughs> I was very stoned, actually, when I was on the TV show. And I'm sure that uh, the Statue of Limitations of Park <laughs> for that. Making her very first television appearance on a wild night. Daddy, what did you think? Well, uh, I think there's no doubt what I consider to be probably one of the worst songs I've ever heard. Uh, I, I came second with that, you know, so I, I just always like, you know, but I, I don't know. I got distracted and I, I actually had my own, well, magazine, which was, well, or zine, you know, called yeah. Eyeball. Mm -hmm. And I published uh, seven editions of the magazine and ended up getting arrested at a Pink Floyd concert and uh, uh, and uh, charged with publishing an obscene magazine. Oh, and if you look at what was in the magazine, it's like pretty mild by today's standards, you oh, know. Well, and, uh, yeah, so I ran away to South America after that and, oh, uh, wow. you know, and became a busker in, in South America and kept myself alive. Raising three dollars a day, oh, wow. uh, you know, and a dollar was for my hotel, a dollar was for food, and a dollar was for transport to the next town. You know, oh, and so I just sort of lived my my. I've always sort of lived by my wits a bit, really, and mm. just just sort of like things happen and appear, and with yeah, with, with the live or well, the punk, the live music scene, everything. I was enamoured. I mean, I've always been interested in every sort of music, really. I've never identified specifically with one style of music or other, really. I've always enjoyed whatever's around and, uh, you know, and, and look for the, the best in that kind of kind of music. And I remember seeing in, in London, seeing the 101ers, which was the prequel to... The Clash. It was Joe Strummer's band, oh, wow. and he. And it was funny because in those days, in 1975, you know, it was like the tail end of the psychedelic movement, mm. progressive rock movement, and the disco era, really. And then the, yeah. the 101 ers were playing this raw R and B music, and I was thinking, wow, that's very refreshing, you know. Yeah. And it was the yeah. precursor to punk music, which is basically oh. stripping it down to you know, very basic music to start a game type thing, yeah. you know. Yeah. So then, you know, and then I, so I got involved in the, the punk scene coming to Australia again, coming back to Australia in 1975 and um, being involved in the community radio scene. And uh, I had a radio show on PBS. Well, it, it started with a test transmission yeah. through PBS FM. And I asked to do a punk show, and they actually had to have a board meeting to oh, decide if that was okay. Because <laughs> uh, you know, and they said, "Oh, well, that was a, yeah, an unrepresented style of music in Melbourne at the time." Yeah. And I remember playing uh, uh, "Anarchy in the UK" uh, by the Sex Pistols. From I recorded uh, a, a, a radio show to Double J. Mm -hmm. You know, when it was on AM radio yeah. and they'd actually got a tape sent to them from the UK and played it. So it wasn't released as a record yet. I recorded it and the following week I played it on the test transmission oh. on PBS. So I, I, cl I claim the... Uh, yeah, that, that I I played the Sex Pistols first in Melbourne, not Australia, oh. but Melbourne. Yeah, so. that's really, <laughs> yeah, that's really interesting. Wow, uh, very interesting. Yeah, yeah, and then through the radio show, uh, which was called Radio Pop, actually, yeah. I met 
Uh, the king of St Kilda, uh, the punk king of St Kilda, Fred Negro. I don't know. In his yep. <laughs> early ba earlier bands uh, called The Edition. G'day, Fred Negro's the name. I draw the uh, pub strip in uh, in press and various other publications. And basically, what I do is just chronicle the uh, the history of rat bags in St Kilda. And we bonded actually with a love of the Bonzo Dog Doodah band because I asked each member of the of the editions to bring in their favourite tracks. I'd play them on the show, mm -hmm. and Fred brought in uh, a, a, a track by the Bonzo Dog Doodah band, and who were a big influence on me. <laughs> and if you don't know them. Have a listen because they're oh, pretty man. amazing. And anyway, and so, yeah, so we were friends after that. And then I got invited to record the editions okay. because by then I'd also got a PA system and I was, um, you know, uh, setting up like sound systems for bands and things. And so we set up a system where I had my truck in Ackland Street with a multi-core lead through to their house. They were living in a communal house in Ackland Street in St Kilda. And so they record, they'd play live and I recorded in mixing desk and sort of mixed the balance the sound as they were sort of playing. Yeah. And they released uh, two cassettes and that were the first um, recordings by the editions oh, that they wow. released. I, and think, stuff. Um, I think I did I hear that the editions actually um, uh, wrote a song about the ballroom? Uh, Paul, I'm trying to remember the title. Yeah, I think it was called um, <laughs> Nuns and Priests. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, that's right. I, that, I yeah. think I mentioned that. That's in right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I was watching that actually. That's I was, funny. I was well, watching in, that. In regards to yeah. the, 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 um, the Hotel Esplanade, I know yeah. that obviously it's, you know, been around forever and, mm. you know, the 20s, the 30s, all the way to, to now. Yeah. Um, so I guess I'm sort of interested in the probably 70s, 80s, 90s, but yeah. um, is it true that I read somewhere that there were other venues around um, like the venue and um, the Prince of Wales that kind of attracted the bigger sort of bands, whereas in the beginning um, the SB kind of only sort of, you know, picked up the less exposed artists. W mm. Would that be true? Well, yeah, well, I really? remember a lot of bluesy type bands. I remember people like Phil Parra. Yeah. You know, he played there forever. He was like yeah. this uh, Jimi Hendrix uh, kind of sounding uh, guitarist who's supposed to be very good at copying Jimi Hendrix's style. But I remember w I started managing Ice Spin in a Gravy later. Oh, yes. Yeah, and yeah. I noticed you've got the photo there on this, yeah. you know, Steps the S. Well, I organised that. Oh, wow. And you can see me there with a with a black and white, weird black and white op shop suit. Okay. In yeah. the background there. <laughs> I'm in there and all that. And so, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, yeah. And it was, I mean, it's such an iconic photo, you know. Yeah, absolutely. Incredible. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. But I used to go, I mean, but I remember being so busy. Uh, you know, I just get obsessed with my radio shows. I'd be yeah. working out my radio shows all week, and and also ma in managing bands, managing I spent your gravy, and you know, and then going over to the Esplanade, you know, and that's where they would all drink around. But they'd all congregate there, and their fans and their friends would come around there as well. And it was this amazing uh, sunset through that front yeah. window, the front it's bar, you know. Yeah. But I do remember going there some. Some sort of nights where I used to go to the Prince of Wales a lot because of PBS. His yeah. studio was at the Prince of Wales. Oh, okay. So, yep. Yeah, 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 yeah. Which, which was incredible. You know, like, yeah. what a, you know, like a radio station in a pub. Early eighties. No, then it was the early eighties. I was booking the the St Kilda Inn uh, because they advertised. They wanted a promoter. The guy who was who owned it wanted a yeah. promoter. And I put up my hand and everything. I'd never done it before, and uh, but I came up with the. I, I noticed that there was a plaque above the doorway in the for the lounge room in the in the St Kilda Inn that said the John Lennon room. And it turned out the owner of the pub at the time was a massive Beatles fan. Oh, right. So I said, "Well, how about we call it? Uh, you know, call it the Helter Skelter Club." Oh, wow. And he thought that was fantastic. So I started, uh, he said, yeah, okay, yeah, you got the job, you know. And I started booking the bands. And um, so, yeah, I suppose I, well, at that period of time, I did it for a couple of years. I was in mm -hmm. competition with these other venues. But it turned out at the time that the Seaview Ballroom 
had to close for renovations. There were yeah. massive issues with the building, a building of that age. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, parts of it would be falling down and things like that. And uh, and so it just was a coincidence. And so all the bands that, at that period of time that would be normally playing the Seaview Ballroom, it, it, they had nowhere else to play in St Kilda. Yeah. And so I was getting them all, you know, I'd be getting the Beast Suburban and, Bands like that, some quite, you know, Cosmic Psychos, you know, sort of, you know, big up-and-coming bands at the time, you yeah. know. To my mind, the music they were putting on the the SB at one stage seemed to be a bit daggy, like I'm saying, mm. Phil Barra, nothing yeah. against Phil Barra. Yeah. I don't know the guy. I've never, it's just a name that comes to me. They had this residency there forever, you know. Oh, okay, and yeah. And I just sort of thought, oh, yeah, you know, I was into more, I don't know, interesting, well, more punk or, yeah. they, you know, they had different promoters, have a different a- a idea. And actually I remember. I, I think remember, in 1988 there was a guy called Bruce Matheson and he started doing the whole seven days a week with bands. Oh, that was late 80s in the okay. um, yeah, right. in the lounge bar. And that's when I think right. a lot of punters started to come in droves. Yes. And that and then I think in 1990 the Gershwin room sort of started oh, of to course. Yeah, get yeah, popular. Yeah, yeah that's um, right. Yeah. Yeah. Right. But I, I know also that uh, there were people like, you know, Colin Hay from Men at Work. Okay. Paul, yeah. Paul Kelly. Yeah. Um, lots of those sort of, you know, iconic Aussie um, musicians. Yeah. I've read that they actually started playing at the SB when they were starting out um, yeah. to, yeah, to try out their new material. So I was just wondering <laughs> right. even yeah. were there any kind of bands that you remember seeing there in the early stages of their career? Yeah, I'm trying to remember. Who, the yeah. lights have just gone out actually, Paul. <laughs> I can't oh. see your face. Oh, Okay. Maybe the computer light. Oops. Oh, there's the computer. My other. Computer. Oh, there we go. Gotcha. Yeah, I'm getting I'm getting light from my other computer because. Oh, okay. <laughs> and the, yeah, the so other I'm just one is- just wondering, uh, do you have any kind of um, special kind of nights out at the SV that you <laughs> remember? Oh wow, what a great gig that was. Yeah. Ah, oh, well, I do remember one particular night, the first. Now, what's the what's that Brian Nankervis does? Uh, Rockwiz. Rock oh, the Rockwiz show, yep. And I received an email. I was on his email address asking for audiences to okay. be the first one at, at the at the Esplanade, you know, yeah. and the first show they were filming. It was yeah, like they started that. a pilot. It was the very first one. And so, yeah, I, I answered that and got invited. Oh, great. And got a few people on the on my table and everything yeah. anyway and then what they do is that they have competition between all the tables where our table won yeah and and so i ended up going up on stage oh how funny <laughs> and my you know they have like you know famous musicians as a you know yeah. on the table and joe camilleri was mm. uh, on my on mine but but i do remember drinking too much and, and <laughs> but, you know, obvious questions about, you know, music, I just, it just all, like, escaped me. I was going, oh, and I was so embarrassed because there was a friend of mine, uh, Diz Randell, who, who, and she she's very knowledgeable. I could have said, yeah, you, you go up there. But I wanted to be up there. But I just remember as soon as I had, you know, beyond three drinks, like just my memory but yeah. just turns to mush. And, uh, and go, oh yeah, I know the answer to that one. Yeah, <laughs> it's such a great show. I, I watch it all the yeah. time, actually. And that's as far right. as um, so as, tomorrow, that's for me, obviously. Yeah, and for, but, yeah. I know you've obviously um seen all those kind of bands um that were in Melbourne during the you know that period. And I know, like in New South Wales, I know that a lot of venues in your um in your state have closed. I just wanted to ask you your opinion on why some of these venues have shut down, you know, places like Bombay Rock and and all the other venues um, that have closed. I mean, at, there was a point where the SB was closing. I thought it was going to close down, and um, but it, it is reopened. And I don't know, what, what's your opinion in, in Sydney? Well, it's gentrification. Yeah. And it's just, unfortunately, the buildings are worth more 
yeah. you know, for them to build, it's, you know, build uh, apartments and things, you know. But look, you know, I'm amazed actually how, in spite of all that, how strong, mm. uh, you know, Melbourne is with venues. I mean, if you did, I, I would love to see statistics to see, you know, compare different areas to say, okay, you know, actually, because a lot of it is people with rose coloured glasses, memory type stuff, you know. They have, it's very filtered, you know, and I get like, rather than using statistics to back it up. Because I mean, we are, and even people kind of go, oh, now record shops, you know, there's more. I think we've got 60 record shops in Melbourne, if you can believe that. I mean, some of them are very small, but, yeah. but still, you know, so considering how much lack of support you really get from the government for some, an industry, which is worth, you know, so much money. It's been proved that it's worth a massive amount of money. Yeah. You know, but they they will always be supporting sport, you know. I never really expect much from the government and all that and everything because, you know, they never have. They've never so I've never, Not, you wouldn't expect, my, you know, the government to support live yeah. music particularly, you know. Yeah. At least, you know, I tell people, well, Vote for a fucking uh, for Labor because you won't. You'll get more with Labor, sure, yeah. than you get with Liberal. You know, people unfortunately, you know, vote for, against their self interest. You know, because they've just succumbed to the propaganda. You know that you get. You know, and so people kind of shoot themselves in the foot and they go, "Oh shit, you know, this happened." You go, "Well, what did you expect? You voted for a right wing government. What would you expect from them?" You know what I mean? Yeah. And, but I digress. Well, I know. I, I, know I just you. think, you know, yeah, yeah, I know. But Bombay Rock, well, I know that closed a long, long yeah, time. Yeah, it did. And I mean, look, you know, there were, <laughs> there were a lot of Italians involved in Bombay Rock. With uh, you're going to be careful now because I'm Italian. <laughs> okay. Well, no, but there were questionable connections. <laughs> no, I wouldn't say. I, agree. <laughs> I wouldn't say, you know, obviously, you know. Oh. Come here, come here, come here, come here. My sister again, I'll kill you. I was putting on a show called The Gong Show. Yeah. At the vol- at the venue. Oh, yeah. And, and Joe Galtieri. Oh, he's yeah. amazing. I interviewed him for um for the Bombay Rock. Yeah, he um, has become a Buddhist. So he's lovely. He's a lovely he's man. Better than he was. But I yeah. tell you, what, I got beaten up by his bouncers. Oh, no. <laughs> and I can tell you, I, I don't know if you want to know the the really bad story about women getting left in the toilets at, at the venue. Oh, what yeah. happened to them? Maybe another time. I have another time off camera. But <laughs> yeah. This was before. Bouncers were licensed. Things have changed now. But oh, they, when they were awful. They were a, a, a law unto themselves. Yeah, you know? I know. That was like Sydney as well. Steve yeah. Cummings of the sports. I've got. Um, I've read here that he often performs at the SB and he says that the venue okay. has a great kind of feel that okay. nowhere else in Melbourne has. Right. And it's great for people who wouldn't be able to get in anywhere else. And he reckons that the uh. SB in the front bar yeah. It's wonderful because there's an incredible mixture of ages and different types of people yeah. and it's just a great place to perform. So I know a lot of yeah. musicians just absolutely speak yeah. really highly of um, of the SB. So yeah. Yeah. Well, I do remember a period of time I did go there, you know, and it was ridiculous like downstairs. I remember when yeah. they reopened that, you know, it was a couple of well, probably a few years ago now. Yeah. And I remember that it was like they had the old posters, yeah. you know, that they knew from back in the day that they would have on the wall and change it weekly, you know. Yeah. They, they had a collection of them. They put them in frames. Yeah. And I thought it's like turning into a museum. Yeah, in a sense. Yeah. Those posters would be changing every week to publicise what was happening the week after. Yeah. And then yeah. they put some of those posters in a frame to, you know, and I thought, you, you don't get it. You don't yeah. get it, you know. That, but I that, guess it is a business, you know. You know yeah. And, and they're there to make the money. Well, as far as, as Look, far when as money as, takes over, it, it, it does ruin things sometimes. It does. It does. I'm really glad that it's still there, especially because oh, yeah. the location is, you know, fantastic. Do you still go out and see bands sometimes? Cool. What do they call? I paid the $1,000 to the tote. To, oh, wow. Um, you know, wow. because. Excellent. To, 
Yeah, I, I, presumably I have my name there and I get a free shirt, T-shirt. Yeah, on I did read Don't that. Yet, though, because that's one of my locals. It's not far too. Oh, I, and my other favourite uh, venue is The Gem. And, and it's always free, which is amazing. And they put on in uh, Wellington Street in Collingwood. Oh, okay, and, lovely. And they always put on interesting bands. I saw um, Jerry Lee Lewis's sister play there. That was a number of years ago now. Oh, wow. <laughs> and no one knew that she can play <laughs> piano just as well as her brother can play. Oh, wow. And that was fantastic. Oh, so, that's cool. Yeah, and the Union Hotel on the weekends in Brunswick. That's one of yeah. our favorite. But I love the St Kilda, what well, they call it, the, the Bowls Club as well. There's a gig coming up uh, that Andrew Leavold's involved in, involved in to, to, to make as a fundraiser to make money for him and Fred. Negro to go to Europe okay. uh, to, to show the pub, you know, the film yeah. Fred's in and all that uh, uh, in, in Europe. So that's coming up in March, some day, 6th of March from memory, and they're still trying to, you know, tying up the lineup, but it's going yeah. to be a great, great lineup too. So I wanted to ask you, I have read that Fred is the um, so called king of St Kilda, and I just want to know how he got that reputation. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> How? Oh God! It's uh... just by being Fred Negro, I guess. <laughs> just by Fred Negro. I mean, uh, he he did when I was you know promoting, you know, and I did several venues and the Gong Show and everything. I always got Fred to um, to do my artwork. I mean, yeah. I'll have to dig out. You know, when I've got some time, I'll try and dig out the Helder Skelter ones and yeah. some of the other ones, and I can then I can be ref my memory be refreshed. With who I put on, you know, yeah. and uh, yeah, and I even got uh, kicked out of the the uh, the venue where where I did the Gong Show in Turak Row, yeah, uh, and because I refused uh, to, I, I I said because the the publican didn't like Fred's artwork, you oh, know, okay. pretty racy and. Yeah. Uh, uh, and I said, look, uh, no, sorry, if Fred goes, I go. Yeah. So uh, they said, well. well he, is, he is a legend in uh, Oh, I did, Florida. yeah. So, yeah, yeah. I'm, um, I'm definitely going to include him in, in the, you know, information about him. From St. Kilda to Kingscott.